good? All right. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> so sorry about the, the lag. We were just waiting for people to join and see if we could get more people. And I'm so excited that you guys are joining us from the Sand Hills Regional Library today. My name's Nikki. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at the North Carolina Zoo. And so uh, I wish <laughs> I could be there with you guys, but I know this craziness is happening in our world today. We're gonna do have to do this virtually. So it's a bummer, but it'll still be fun. It's still gonna be interactive. So I'm gonna be asking you guys lots of questions. And so, and I want you to ask me questions too. So type those in the chat. So if you have any questions for me, type them in. And then if I have questions for you, put those in the chat too. And uh, hopefully we'll have some fun. All right, you guys ready to get started? So this year's reading theme, I wanna see uh, how, many, buddy, how many of you guys know what this year's summer reading theme is. I know it was a little bit strange and we're not, <laughs> it's kind of a different summer than we normally experience. Does anybody know? Just type in the chat if you think you know what the, the theme is this year. What the summer? So why, what are they trying to get you to read about? What are they trying to, how are they trying to motivate you to read? Kind of well, Alice said, imagine your story. Yay, yeah, imagine your story, absolutely. So all about fantasies and fairy tales and myths and all that stuff. So that means I gotta create a program about that. And I'm thinking about it, my job, my job as a zoo educator is kind of a, I'm a myth buster, which means I go through, I get people tell me all kinds of stories they've heard about animals and I have to set them straight, <laughs> give them the right, correct information and bust those myths. And there's a lot of them out there. So I'm like, this is perfect. So that's why the program today is called Animal Myth Busters. So we're going to be busting a lot of myths today. Well, let me find out, do you guys know what a myth is? Does anybody out there know what a myth is? What do you think a myth is? Just type in the chat, what do you think a myth? I know there's a little bit of a lag sometimes. <laughs> and we got a couple people, don't be shy guys. This is a fun interactive program. There's no right or wrong answer, no judging here. <laughs> So what do you think a myth is? Has anybody heard of it? <laughs> it's always that, that weird awkward pause of finding in these in these virtual programmings <laughs> as you take a minute to type in and figure stuff out. I got anybody, Denise? Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. So um, Denise is behind the camera and I have Beth back helping us Hi. out too, sharing stuff. So. Um, so if you hear another voice, it's Denise in the room with me. <laughs> she's running the camera and helping with the, the chat and all that stuff. So she'll be my, she's my backup. So anybody have a story about myth or what they think a myth is yet? Yeah, we love um, hearing what you think. So yes, absolutely. Cirque said story. A story, absolutely. It is a story. I don't know if you guys have ever played the games called a telephone. So basically you get in a circle, one person whispers in the person next to them a phrase or a sentence, and then that person whispers around, and then it goes around the circle, and by the time it gets back to the original person, the sentence has changed completely. That to me is what kind of a myth is. So it started off as a story, so probably a, a, some little bit of truth to it, and then I got passed on, and I got exaggerated, I got blown out of proportion. Um, so some of the myths have a little bit of truth to it, some of them are completely crazy wrong, and then some of them actually are true. So there's all kinds of different ways of seeing it. So myths are kind of stories about something, something that has been passed on in generations. So you guys are gonna help me be myth busters. So we're gonna start with our first myth, okay? Our first myth is, so when I <coughs> tell you, when I tell you the myth, I want you to type in the chat whether you think it's true or if you think it's busted, all right? So you're gonna tell me if it's true or busted. You think it's true or false, is what busted means, all right? So, our first myth, right? And there's a ton of them, we're not gonna get through all of them. I wish we could, we'd be here all day. So our first one is, this one here a lot, bats are blind, okay? Bats are blind, so type in the chat if you think bats are blind, if you think it's true, you think bats are blind, or if you think it's false, that bats are blind. What do you guys think? and type in the chat, true or busted. I'm gonna 
come over here. Sorry, I just want to check this computer right here. I'm going to make it a big screen so we can. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I have a computer over here too, so just want to see what's going on. Okay, so so far there's two trues. Okay, that's trues. Okay, so bats are blinds. So think... And if there, guy, there's no right or wrong. Like I said, this is this is my job. This is what I love doing. I love giving people the correct answer because this one is actually. Bats actually have pretty good vision. They use another sense to find their food and find things, but they still can still see. Does anybody know what that sense is? How do bats here in North Carolina find insects, the food that they eat? How are they able to catch food at night? If not just using their, their sight, what other sense do they have? Does anybody know what that's called? Let's see, Is that an idea of what they use to be able to catch a bug flying through the air. So I know that fancy science word begins with an E. Oh, I see sonar. Yeah, you're very close. You're very close. It's very similar. Let's see. Anyone else? The echo. You want to finish that for me? Starts out with echo. <laughs> echo, echo, echo. The rest of it. <laughs> I think you're still typing. <laughs> okay, I know it's it's hard. <laughs> That's right. It's tough doing this the virtual there's thing. Echo sounding. And you're, you're getting there. You're getting there. So they're sending out an echo to locate. Oh, there we go. There we got go. it. We got it. Nice echo location, right? So that's a that's what they use, but they still have really good eyesight. So if Miss Beth, if you show our first picture, I do believe it is a a bat picture. Let's see. So Beth is helping me share some really cool pictures. So this guy right here. So does anybody know what kind of bat he is? It's kind of um gives it a big clue. It's in his mouth. Does anybody know what he's holding? Though so it looks like. Probably nothing you've ever eaten. <laughs> a type of this that you've never eaten. Oh, we got it from Circa Fruit Bat. Nice, nice job. You're right. That is a fruit bat. And if you notice, is it daytime or nighttime that they're eating their fruit? You guys notice? What type of day? What kind of day? What time of the day is it? Good oh, Lord. I'm having a rough time speaking today, so I apologize. <laughs> so if you notice, he's looking for fruit in the daytime. Because there are very few, some bats are actually daytime animals, and fruit bats are one of those. But they, so they use their eyesight. So you notice they have really big eyes. So they don't use the echolocation like other bats because they don't have to chase down a fruit, right? When was the last time you had to chase down an apple? Unless it rolled off your table. So, so they don't have to chase down their fruit. So they use their eyesight and their nose, their sense of smell, be able to find their food. Okay, Beth, you can go back to me. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll kind of show you. So this is a fruit bat skull, and you can just see how big those eyes are. Look how huge that is. And the teeth, too. Catching that fruit. Right? So they use those eyes, those big eyes, to be able to see that fruit. So bats actually, all bats actually have a good scent eyesight. So they're not blind. So there we go. Myth number one, busted. All right, you guys ready for my next one? Okay, this one I hear a lot. I've heard a lot of times and <laughs> forgot to bring my gloves. So can you grab the gloves and gloves over there? Sorry, thank you, Denise. <laughs> so this one, guys, tell me, type in your chat, is it true or busted? Cockroaches can survive. <laughs> A nuclear war. I need because I can get. Do you guys think true or busted? Can cockroaches survive a nuclear war? What do you guys think? And while you're thinking about that and taking that in, I'm gonna get our first live friend out. Okay. Good morning. Be a chill one. Oh, you're a good one. All right. So cockroaches can survive a nuclear war. What do you think? Is that true or busted? Will we, anybody answered? We got two so far. Okay. Um, so true. True and a busted. All right. So we're nice. kind of 50-50 there. All right. 
well, you know what? Both of you are right. <laughs> so it's kind of true and it's also kind of busted. So it's busted in the fact that if you were in the middle of a nuclear war or a bomb went off, nothing is going to survive that because that is a hundred, excuse me, a million degrees Celsius of heat. It's that hot. It's like sitting in the middle of the sun. Nothing can survive that, not even a cockroach. But there's a little bit of truth to that because if the cockroach isn't, wasn't in the bomb area, but maybe off to the edges, because what happens is after a nuclear bomb, there's something called radiation that comes and that's what affects us and makes us sick and can kill us, right? And, uh, and lots of animals too. So radiation impacts our cells, our cells ability to kind of to grow and, and make new cells because we're constantly making new cells. Our body is constantly growing new cells every day, all the time. And so that radiation affects that ability to be able to do that. And so we can only withstand about a thousand units of radiation and before we would either get really, really sick or possibly die. A cockroach here, a cockroach right here can actually live through 10,000 units of radiation before it make them sick or die. So they can withstand radiation, much more radiation than we can. So that's kind of where that, that myth got started. So yeah, they can't, they're not gonna survive right in the middle of the bomb, but the after effects, yeah, they'll survive it much better than we will because they don't change their cells as much as we do. So theirs is going really, really slow. And so it doesn't impact as much because they have a very simple body and they don't change their cells as much as we do. They don't have to change it very often. So that's why they can do it. So it is kind of true and it's kind of busted. Isn't he cute? A little close up. <laughs> He's waving at you with his antenna. Saying hello. So this is the world's largest cockroach. So this is a giant cave cockroach. And they're pretty awesome. How many of you guys like cockroaches out there? Anybody? Let's see. Anybody like our cockroaches? Uh, there is a question. <laughs> I'm a little bit. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Sir asks, since the shrimp is a is the cockroach of the ocean, will it too survive? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. Never even looked into that, but you can. That's what we love about Google <laughs> and the websites. So, yeah, I don't know. I might have to look that up. That's actually a really interesting question. And I've never heard of the shrimp as being the cockroach of the oceans. <laughs> so that's a new term for me too. So anybody, so this is a giant cave cockroach. Like I said, any fans of the cockroaches? Anybody answer? Nobody, nobody wants to <laughs> be afraid to answer. <laughs> They're actually pretty awesome. So most cockroaches are pretty harmless. So a lot of people think of cockroaches as being pests and harmful and they'll come into your house and eat your food, spread diseases, that kind of thing. But there's over a thousand different species of cockroaches and really only about 30 of them actually would do that, would come in your house and cause troubles. And he is definitely not one of them. He is a cave cockroaches and he actually has a pretty important job. So he lives in caves and we met a friend in our last myth, those bats like to live in caves, right? And bats like to poop a lot. And there's someone at the bottom of that cave cleaning up after the bats. And that's these guys. Sorry, he's very, very active. It's very warm in here. So he's kind of like, woohoo. And I'm warm, so yeah. So they are poop eaters. So they're actually cleaning out the cave. So the important job, a lot of our cockroaches have an important job. They're cleaning up the world for us. They're kind of the recyclers of the world. So they're cleaning up that poop. Cause you know, somebody's gotta do it. Dirty job, but somebody's gotta do it, right? And so they're actually cleaning out those caves for the bats and making it so there's not less diseases, a lot less uh, harm is coming out. <laughs> he is, I'm gonna put him back because he's getting super busy, super active. And I don't want to hurt him. Oh, sorry buddy. Your sticky feet are caught. There we go. All right. So very important job. People think of cockroaches as being just gross and disgusting, but they actually clean up the world for us. They help us clean up the world and recycle the world for us. So super important. So that myth was kind of true and kind of busted. So that's what I said. That's why myths, some myths are true. Some of them are completely far off and some of them are, are you know, kind of in between the both. All right, our next one, and I hear this one a lot. 
owls can turn their heads all the way around. You guys think, is that true or is that busted? So type in chat if you think owls, I'm gonna see if I, sorry, my, my big hands don't like to fit. <laughs> and puppets made for kids. So can an owl turn his head all the way around like this puppet? We have a false. Okay. Busted. Nice. A busted, yeah. Okay. Two busted so far. Nice. Well, you guys are right. It is totally busted. So just think about that. If you're taking the lid off a peanut butter jar or any jar and you turn it all the way around, what happens to it? It pops off, right? <laughs> what happened to their head? Would kind of defeat the purpose, right? They need their heads. So it is very much busted. So they can't turn all the way around, but pretty close, guys. So how far can you guys turn your heads? Go ahead and turn your head as far as you can go. Yeah, it can only go measly, what, 90 degrees? How far can you turn your head, Denise? Mm, 90 degrees yeah. one way. Yeah, that's us with the Indians. <laughs> we can't do it very far. But an owl can go, he can go 90 degrees, 180 degrees, look over his back, and then he can look over the other shoulder. So about 270 degrees, or like a C. And they can do it really fast, too. I love watching owls do that. Zoop, zip their heads right around. So yeah, so not quite all the way around, but pretty close. A lot farther than we can, that's for sure. So that's kind of that, probably where that myth got started. They thought, oh, they can turn their heads all the way around because they can do it really fast. That's probably where they got started. Because what they'll do is they'll look over this way and then all of a sudden they'll zip around and look around. I can't do it very fast that way. It almost looks like they can turn their head all the way around, but they cannot. Oh, their head would pop off. That would not be good. We don't want that. We don't want headless owls running around. <laughs> that would be pretty creepy. So that one is definitely busted. Nice job, guys. All right. Miss Beth, you can show our next picture. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. All right. This one, this one's kind of a little bit of a two-parter. So a possum can hang by their tails. Is that true or is that busted? The possums can hang by their tail. <laughs> Okay, so one said the babies can. Oh, nice. There you go. Um, someone said true. Okay. This is that kind of a little bit of true, a little bit of false. So, Beth, you can come back to me. So, I like who said that? Who said that the uh, babies can? Alice. Alice. Okay, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, so the babies can because they don't weigh much. But as they get older, they put on some weight. <laughs> Don't like me. They can't do it anymore. The tail's not that strong. So they can only do it for a little while when they're young. They don't do that all the time. So mostly they use that tail for balance or collecting things. So they'll collect leaves and stuff and carry it up to their nest or for the babies to kind of hang on to too. So it's a little bit true. So when they're small, they can, but as they get older, they can't hang from there. So they just a little bit busted them. And then my other myth about opossums our opossums are nuisances. And by nuisances, I mean they're pests because, you know, they're dirty, they spread diseases, they're just gross. So what do you guys think? Is that true or is that busted? Are opossums nuisances? I mean, how can something this cute be a nuisance, right? Well, so far, Cirque said busted. Busted. Nice. Here's an opossum skull. True with a question mark. <laughs> That's okay. Like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. I will take any answers you guys have. I'm not judging here. This is what we're all here to learn. I'm still learning things. Every time I do these programs, I learn something new. So absolutely. So that one definitely is, I'm going to get a sign out for this one. It is busted. Opossums are awesome. They do way more good than harm. Possums will eat 4,000 ticks a year. I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty awesome. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. A lot of people think, oh, they spread diseases, they can get rabies, all that stuff. But possums actually very, 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 very rarely will get rabies. Their body temperature is too low for the rabies virus to grow in. So you're not going to get a rabbit opossum. Very, 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 very rarely will that happen. And another thing is, they have such a good immune system that if a venomous snake were to bite them, they would survive. They'd be okay. 
and scientists are actually studying their blood and why they can survive that in the hopes that one day they'll actually make have to make be able to make what we call an antivenom so if you get bit by a snake you take the, the antivenom of that type of snake to help you counteract the effects of the venom and so they're hoping that with this opossum blood they'll make a universal antivenom which means you can get bit by any type of snake in the world take this one antivenom and be okay which would be amazing right and that'd be cool and all thanks to the awesome opossum so they are definitely not nuisances they're very cool to have around so yay opossums all right my next myth guys turtles can climb out of their shells is that true or is that busted? Can a turtle climb out of its shell? Then I have a friend we can ask. Oops, grab my gloves. What do you guys think? True or busted? Can turtles, turtles can climb out of their shells? We have the true. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, Wallace. You want to come out and tell him? Hey, buddy. Thank you for not nope. making a mess. So there's a true busted and a busted. All right, Wallace, what do you think? Can you climb out of your shell? Let's see if he'll answer for us. What do you think? Wallace, can you climb out of your shell? <laughs> that almost looks like he's, he's nodding his head yes. I know. <laughs> But actually, he's saying that myth is busted. He cannot climb out of his shell because if you look on the inside of a turtle shell, oh, it's very dark. It's hard to see. I'm trying to find a good angle. There we go. If you look on the inside of that shell, what do you see running down the middle of that shell? I if that helps. There we go. It's a little bit better. Whoop, nope, too far. <laughs> right, I see someone said a spine. Absolutely. So that is their spine or their backbone. So their shell is actually literally their spine and their ribs. And so it is their back. So as they get bigger, the shell gets bigger and it grows with them. So they don't leave and go get another shell. So their spine, the shell, it's their backbone. It's their spine. It's like you guys can't pull out your spine and get a new one, right? Well, Wallace here can't do that either. And Wallace, he's one of our newest animal ambassadors. So I know, I know Alice has not been able to see these yet because we have never used them in any of our programs yet over the years that we've been coming to Moore County for their programs. So this is Wallace and he is what we call a Western Santa Cruz tortoise, or which means he's a type of Galapagos tortoise. Has anybody heard of that? And so he's actually, <coughs> excuse me, he's a baby. He's very, very small. You know, he looks pretty big. <laughs> and he's gotten bigger since we've gotten him. It's been pretty cool to see him grow. But he's still pretty small. I'm saying about, I don't know, five, ten years. There's no way I'm going to hold him like this. <coughs> excuse me. So he is just a baby. When they get full grown, he can weigh up to 500 pounds. And he could be from the head to his tail, almost six feet long. So he's gonna be a big, the largest tortoise in the world. They are huge. But right now he's tiny and I can hold him one-handed, but I'll give him a little more support. Do you guys have any questions about Wallace here? <laughs> Looks like he's nodding his head at you guys. It's so like, cool. please ask questions. <laughs> I think yes. Oh, take questions. Cool. So he's pretty awesome. And we're very excited to have him because he's actually an endangered, but his, his wild his wild neighbors, his cousins, they're actually endangered. Because unfortunately they live on these islands and people have come and they started moving on the islands and they brought pests like you know dogs and cats and foxes and rats and stuff like that to these islands we never had any of these things before they never had those predators those other animals that would eat them or their babies or their young 
And so they just kind of decimated them. And then because they were so big, a lot of the sailors a long time ago would actually take these onto their ship and use them as a food supply because they can actually go a full year without eating, which means they can have them living on the ship and not have to worry about feeding them. They just have to clean up after them every once in a while. Um, so that way they did not have to feed them and they didn't have to worry about, you know, that's like having a cow on your, on your ship that doesn't eat. So it was a food source. And so that's kind of why their numbers went down drastically, but they are protected and they're slowly coming back. So we do have a few questions yes, so far. absolutely. So um, first and foremost, what does Wallace eat? Oh, good question. And how so, much does he eat? Oh, well, <laughs> he actually, they eat a lot. He's got a friend named Darwin. <laughs> and so they eat a lot and a lot of it is vegetables. So they are herbivores. So that fancy science word for to eat just plants. And so we feed him lots of lettuce. He likes grasses. Um, and some vegetables now and then, but mostly it's a lot of greens and stuff that they like to eat. And I've seen them, they'll put out, literally, they'll put out a tray of food about this big and they both just devour it. <laughs> it's fun to watch them eat. So they eat a lot, which means they poop a lot. That's why when I brought them out, I'm like, oh God, did you leave a big mess in there for me? Because they like to do that sometimes. I'll bring them out and they just, it's their, their travel home is kind of gross. <laughs> but luckily he didn't do that today. Thank you, Wallace. We appreciate that because they do eat a lot. Good questions. Any other questions? Um, so it says, is it true a tortoise grows larger than turtles or can turtles grow just as large? Well, there are some sea turtles that get really, really, really big. Okay. So uh, it's kind of a, I'm trying to think, I totally just drew a blank. It, the Galapagos are the largest one, right? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I just, so I have, uh, Beth is my backup person. Beth, is that true? These guys are the largest tortoises or turtles total. Are there, is there a largest sea turtle? I can't remember. I'm telling you guys, my brain, <laughs> it's gone. So <laughs> it needs a vacation. Is Beth helping us out? <laughs> not, not yet, but um, so, no wait, the largest land, yes, but pretty sure leatherback is bigger. The bigger, okay. That's why I wasn't sure. I'm like, damn it, I think there was a turtle. There's a, a sea turtle that is bigger. So yeah, so he is the largest land turtle tortoise and then there are so but you think about it if you're in the ocean you can get bigger because the water will support you better there so yeah that's why these guys have these huge they're not water turtles so you can see their feet <laughs> oh forget there's a <laughs> I just verified the leatherback is the largest okay excellent thank you thank you thank you see i learn things every day <laughs> so could, i don't know everything so could we say then that you know, most tortoises are larger than the average turtles that we see around here. Well, these do because if you, yeah, so they are definitely most tortoises kind of are around here. So we don't really I'm trying to think. Our largest turtles we have in North Carolina are actually pond turtles, um, and so they're water turtles. So I, I think, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's I'm not going to get into that theory. <laughs> That's all it is. So that's the largest turtle we have in North Carolina, I do believe is a pot of the, is that the um, snapping turtles. They can get pretty big and they're a water turtle. So their largest land turtle we have, I believe is our box turtle and they don't get big at all. Yeah, good questions. All right, I'm gonna put Wallace back. Thank you, Wallace. Rock. He's got a nice little bed of hay in there for him nice and cozy. All right, so that myth was definitely busted. Turtles cannot climb out of their shell. Nope. So my next one, I hear this one a lot. So as I was, a, I'm a bird nerd, hope you guys know me, love birds, worked in, you know, around rehab centers with baby birds and that kind of thing. So I heard this one a lot. Parents of baby birds will reject their babies if you touch them. What do you guys think? Is that true or is that busted? You guys think so if a, you touch a baby bird do you think the parent will smell it and leave that baby bird alone? They'll, they'll reject it they don't want to do anything to do with it so Is we have true? a we have a busted and a true okay all right well miss beth if you'll show um our next picture all right, all right. here's my little baby horn mark 
<laughs> got to work with these guys and raise them over at the desert. So these are um, baby horn larks. So if you find a baby on the ground that is, you know, eyes are closed, they're, you know, they're kind of either naked or half naked, and they just have those fuzzy little downy feathers, it is safe to touch it, pick it up, and put it back in the nest if you can. Because most birds do not have a sense of smell. So they will not smell your scent on that baby. All right, Beth, you can bring it back to me. All right. So if you find a baby bird, you can put it back up on the nest and then just watch from afar. Make sure mom and dad will come back to feed it. If you can't find the nest, you can create, make a nest. You can find a um, container. Anything that has holes on the bottom, basically. Anything that has holes. Like I drilled some holes in a Tupperware container. You can use uh, like a strawberry basket or anything like that. And you can just put a bunch of soft materials, like grasses. Like this was a cardinal nest, guys. This is kind of cool. So it's just made out of grasses, some dried grasses. So if you can find dried grasses or some, you know, anything kind of soft and line the bottom, put the baby, well, hang it up first, <laughs> then put the baby bird in there, and then watch. If mom and dad come and start feeding them, you're good to go. If they don't, then you should probably take it to a rehab center like that. But if you find a bird like this, <laughs> he's got all his feathers on. He's still young, but he's got all his feathers on like that. He has actually jumped out of that nest on purpose. He's what we call a fledgling. So he jumped out on purpose. So he's learning to fly. He's leaving the nest. It's time to go and, and, and become an adult bird. And so basically just make sure dogs and cats are away and just leave it alone. Mom and dad are probably nearby helping them out, ready to feed them or doing it, help them out in any way they can. And just leave them and watch them. And you'll see mom and dad come. You know, if you stand back far enough, they will come and feed them and take care of them. But again, if they're injured or if they're not, then you can take them to a local rehab center. So yeah, so it is safe to touch a baby bird and help them out. So, yes, so that net is definitely busted. All right, our next one, guys. This one I hear a lot too. And this animal has a lot of myths, but we're only gonna go through a couple of them. So baby venomous snakes are more dangerous than adult venomous snakes. Is that true or is that busted? You just think, so a baby venomous snake is more dangerous than adult snake. So there's a true and two busted. Okay, awesome. This one is busted. I hear it a lot. I hear people say, well, you know, if you get bit by a baby venomous snake, they will inject all their venom into you and it's more dangerous than adult. But you gotta think about it, guys. Think about size. So a baby venomous snake is much smaller, right? Which means for every one unit of venom they can put out, an adult can put out 10 times more. So an adult can put out more venom and the adult's venom is actually their, uh, their effects on your body is actually more potent than babies. And so as they get older, their, their venom actually becomes more toxic. So adult venomous snake is much more dangerous than a baby one. I don't suggest getting bit by either. <laughs> okay, so avoid them all together. And most of the time, they want to avoid you too. They don't want to bite you because they know you are too big and they don't want to waste this. This takes that venom that they produce, it takes a lot of energy. And so they don't want to waste it. They know they can't eat you. And so they only use it if they, in the absolute extremes when they have to protect themselves. So if you're stepping on them, you're poking them, you're trying to pick them up and, and harass them, then they will use it. But for the most part, they'll leave you alone. You know, so just if you see a venomous snake like this copperhead here, and I can tell it's a copperhead because they have a pretty cool pattern. It looks like, you see that right there? Hershey's Kiss. So like that. And then in the top, it looks like two kisses coming to meet to kiss. Two kisses kissing. <laughs> so the top's there. Or an hourglass, however you want to see it. So wide on the side, narrow on the top, and wide back on the other side. So that's how I can tell it's a copperhead. And that's probably one of the most common one we have around here. 
and luckily their toxin is probably the least potent of all our venomous snakes in North Carolina. So the copper. So the best thing is just avoid them, leave them alone. They're beautiful snakes. I love their colorings. So just leave them alone and you'll be fine. All right, so leave them all alone. <laughs> but yeah, so adults are definitely much more dangerous than the babies. But avoid all of them at all costs. All right. My la my next myth has to do. <laughs> Get my friend out. So snakes are slimy. What do you guys think? Is that true or is that busted? Snakes are slimy. <laughs> Just taking that <laughs> this bag. What do you guys think? Is that true or busted? Are snakes slimy? Have you guys ever touched a snake? This is why I'm bummed about having to do this virtually because in if we were in person, you'd actually get a chance to touch our next friend and find out for yourself whether you think a snake is slimy or not. So there's two busteds. Okay. Nice. Who do we have today? I forgot. Um, Slinky? I don't know. It should be on the container, I think. The kids' little home away from home. Yeah. Someone <laughs> said, I had a pet snake for a while. Nice. Cool. What kind of snake did you have? Let's see. No. Well, because they, they live in the same habitat. I think this is Slinky. All right. So, what do we say? We got Ooh, okay. some bust, a lot of busteds, right? Yeah. So, they're not slimy. You're right. So, if you ever touch a snake, they're actually, they look slimy because when you look at their skin and the light hits it, it's shiny because their scales are so smooth. A lot of them are very smooth and they actually shine sometimes. So it almost looks like they're kind of wet, but they're not. So the only time they're slimy is after they've just gotten out of water. <laughs> He's saying hi. He's smelling you guys, right? Or tasting you. <laughs> oh, now of course he stopped now that I pointed it out. So does anybody know what kind of snake he is? They're very common around here in North Carolina. I see him a lot. Let's see. And our friend who had a pet snake had a Colombian red-tailed bubba. Oh, cool. Oh, those are beautiful. I've worked with them. They're very pretty snakes. And I like that they don't get too big, which is kind of nice. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Being very rude. Oh, we've got black snake. Black snake. All right. So they changed. The Scientists like to change things up, and my old brain can't keep up. So they're, we're calling these guys Eastern rat snakes now. So we're not calling them black rat snakes because they actually come in different color phases. And sometimes you can see, Slinky's not all black. He's got some spots of white on him. And so he's got some patterning on him. And so he is an Eastern rat snake. And so he's kind of the, the black phase of it. And there are yellow ones, things like that. So they do come in different colors. So he is an Eastern rat snake. So that tells you, what do you think he eats? What's he sniffing for right now? Besides a camera lens. <laughs> what do you think he'd like to eat? Well, I like someone is a black racer. So he's not a racer, but there is a black racer and there is the, the Eastern rat snake. And you can tell the difference because Eastern, or so the, the rat snakes have more white on their chin and their eyes are smaller. So black racers are tend to be smaller, thinner, and they almost have like buggy eyes, bigger eyes. <laughs> He's pretty cool. He's really interested in this camera lens. <laughs> Must have some good sense on it. Oh, so right, so he eats rats, rats and mice, all kinds of things, right? So he's a pest controller. So he's out there eating those rats and those mice, keeping those diseases that they carry and spread kind of in check. And so very important job, just like the cockroach. A lot of people misunderstand them. I think they do more harm than good, but it's actually the opposite. They do more good than harm. And so they're pretty awesome. So <laughs> can you see that that tongue is pretty awesome? He's really showing you guys. So what is he doing with that tongue? I kind of said it a little bit. What do you guys think? What's he doing with that tongue? Why is he sticking it out so much? Is he being rude? Does he have a purpose for that? What do you guys think? <laughs> I'm gonna keep him up here as long as he can stick out his tongue at you. So 
kind of said it earlier. So what's he saying? To their shoes to, to feel, feel smelling, yeah. tasting the air. Smelling, tasting, right. So our smell and our taste are kind of kind of mixed, right? They're they're kind of one and the other. They go hand in hand. So he is. He's kind of collecting odor particles in the air. They're collecting on his tongue, and then he's got a cool little organ in the top of his his jaw, on the upper part of his jaw. It's called the Jacobson's organ, and that's telling him what he's tasting or smelling. And if you notice. Is his tongue just straight or is it forked? Is it kind of got two tips? What do you think? It's got two tips on there. He's really showing you. <laughs> like I said, there's something good on this camera lens. He keeps sticking his tongue out and smelling it. So it is forked, right? Why do you guys think he has a forked tongue? Why do snakes have forked tongues? think and think about it why do you have ears on opposite sides of your head why do you have two nostrils why do you have two eyes right? why do you think you have two of each of these senses what do you think so if somebody's yelling can you tell where the sound is coming from? Because your ears are on the opposite side of your head. So that's kind of what he's doing. So he is, so scent particles that are collected, oops, hi buddy, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on one side of his tongue, he can tell where something is. So if there was a mouse to his right, that those mouse odor particles are gonna collect more onto the right hand side of his that tongue, that fork there. And so he's kind of smelling in direction. So we can smell where things are in direction, kind of like we hear in direction. So we can tell where sounds are coming from. So it's pretty cool. Do we have any questions about Thank you. Well, I'm surprised. We usually have a ton of questions about That's snakes. That's pretty cool. Never knew that. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. He seems to love the camera. <laughs> he really does. He's, he's almost uh, like he's posing like <laughs> he's pretty chill today or she i can't get him straight my old brain doesn't remember things like i used to <laughs> so we have a, a male and a female we have scoots and we have slinky i think where's the scoots scoots is the female right i think <laughs> Gosh. i gotta keep you straight she looks smaller which it sh she looks smaller than the other one so i do believe this is the female she looks much smaller i don't know yeah, Beth said Scoots and Slinky are brother and sister. Yeah. They live together in the same habitat. Yeah. <laughs> and they look alike, but uh, the male is much bigger. So that's why I think this is the female. And they believe that's Scoots. I'm right. <laughs> they probably have them mixed. I'm sorry, guys. My brain is just, it's done. <laughs> All right. No questions about our lovely, beautiful schnicks? All right, bud. I'm going to put him back in his travel home, maybe. I thought I could do this in one-handed. Hi. But no, he was comfortable. He liked his, uh, he liked being able to see you guys. <laughs> Through the camera. There you go. All right. Nice job, buddy. Oh, they woke him up. I think he was taking a nap. How do you tell if a snake is taking a nap? Can you guys tell if a snake is taking a nap? So, snakes are definitely not slimy. That is definitely, not, unless of course they just came out of the water. All right, guys, our last myth. This is our biggest one. Literally, about the biggest animal. One of our largest land animals. So elephants never forget. True or busted? What do you guys think? Elephants never forget. True or busted? Busted, busted with an exclamation point too. <laughs> just checking to see what time it is make sure i don't run over i don't want to keep you guys here too long all right true with some question marks okay. yeah no judgments absolutely true or busted true or busted this one is true elephants have an amazing memory guys so think about it so 
if an elephant leaves its herd to move on to another herd, and you know, as it grows up and gets bigger, and it runs across its family, like 20, 30 years later, they'll recognize each other. And they get all excited and they join, you know, they make all kinds of noise when they see each other. So they remember their family members 20 years later, which is pretty awesome. But what makes their memory really, really good, not I'm gonna notice, they're kind of big. So do you think they eat a lot of food? If you are a 10,000 pound animal or more, do you, do you eat a lot of food? What do you guys think? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. They can eat up to 200 or more pounds of food a day, 200 pounds of food a day. So let's think about that in um, quarter pounders, all right? I'm going to get you guys to do some math. So if you, how many quarter pounders would you have to eat to make one pound? So if you're eating a quarter pound of meat, you would need to eat how many burgers to make one pound of meat? I think you guys didn't make you do math, did you? <laughs> Let me see. What do you guys think? Ready? Four. There you go. Right. Four. You have to eat four. So just to get to the one pound, you have to eat four burgers of one pound, and you're eating 200 pounds of food. So what's four times 200? Let's see. Math. I know. <laughs> it's a struggle. Thank you. <laughs> 800. 800. Nice job. So 800 quarter pounders you'd have to eat a day. Could you imagine? Whew. I kind of couldn't eat too. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a lot of food. And so they have to find that food. And there's a group of them. There's always a herd of them. And they're looking around and they're all, each of them, it could be up to 10 or more. That's, you know, that's a lot of food they have to find. And so they're always walking around looking for food. And so they have these huge home territories, these territories that they know, these maps, they have these mental maps of their home territories where all the food is. And some of those territories can be as big as Rhode Island, the whole state of Rhode Island. So they're huge. And they remember where things are. It's, oh, the water's here this time of year. Oh, there's, I know this awesome grass grows right over here this time of year. And they remember that. And they walk around and they find that. But sometimes, as they're walking around, they come across a farmer's field of food. And they're like, oh, oh my goodness, it's a buffet, right? And they go right in that field and they just start munching and eating all those crops. Do you think the farmers like that? What do you guys think? The all, if you had all of a sudden your, you know, your livelihood, you're growing these crops, you can feed your family, you can feed your, you know, livelihoods, so you can survive. And you come out and there's elephants eating all your food. Right? They're not going to like that. And so they kind of view elephants as, as pests, as like we would view like rice, <laughs> rice, mice, rats, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so there has been a lot of conflict. So the farmers will try to get rid of the elephants and then the elephants are trying to protect themselves. And so there's been a lot of um, sometimes injuries and sometimes deaths between the two. And so North Carolina Zoo was like, well, we want to find out why. Let's learn from these elephants. And let's see if maybe we can help these farmers out and end that conflict. So for decades, several decades now, we've had our head vet actually has been going over and they pick out the matriarch. Does anybody know what a matriarch is? The big fancy science word for women rule, right? So the head female. And so because where she goes, everybody else goes. So if they call her her, they don't have to worry about calling any other, other uh, elephants in the herd. So they find the matriarch and they will put a collar on her. And so Miss Beth, if you show our last picture, I think it is, right? So that's our, our head vet, Dr. Loomis. Well, he's a retired now. Um, but yeah, they put these ginormous radio telemetry collars on them. They're huge. So you can imagine because elephants are huge and that way they can track. And so they have to anesthetize the animal, put it to sleep, put the collar on, and then reverse it, and she wakes up, and she's fine. All right, Beth, you can come back to me. Could you imagine having to, to do that with a wild elephant, a huge 10,000-pound animal? It's crazy. And so, so they do that, and that way they can track where those elephants are going. And for years, they've been keeping track, and now they know kind of their migration pattern, where they're moving. So they can see, hey, the elephants are up here this time of the year, so go ahead and plant your crops and harvest them down here, and then by the time you've harvested, the elephants have moved down, and you can crop 
plant your crops over here and they'll be safe. And so since we've been giving them that information, they've been able to work around the elephants, there's been no conflict. And so that's happened in um, Cameroon and we're moving on to other countries in Africa to help them too. And so it's a pretty cool thing that we can do. So just by learning animals and, and working around them, we can live together, learn to live together. And you guys can help elephants too. Um, I think, I think Alice, did I send these to you? I can't remember now. If I haven't, I can actually share them again. Um, just let me know, just email me and let me know. So we have some elephant pledges, um, or if you don't have them, you can go to our website, nczoo.org, and we have a virtual page, and there's a craft section. And if you go on there, you'll find these. So they're fun little coloring pages, and they have different pledges that you can take to help elephants. Like this one says, now that we're open, yay! <laughs> it says, I pledge to visit North Carolina Zoo. Because when you come to the zoo, part of the admission tickets actually go to the conservation work that we do. Helping elephants, helping gorillas, helping all kinds of different animals all around the, you know, in Africa and here in our backyard too. So coming to the zoo helps us and it's fun. You know, two for one there. You help save some animals and you come and have a nice day at the zoo. Uh, let's see. I pledge to learn more about elephants and share them with people to share that, that knowledge and that love of elephants and other people so they're aware of what's going on with elephants. Because there's a big thing called ivory. Unfortunately, elephants are poached or illegally hunted for these tusks right there, so for their ivory. And so you can go to 96elephants.org and take the ivory pledge. They say, I will never buy ivory, and I will tell my friends to never buy ivory, that kind of thing and we'll keep the ivory on the elephants where it belongs, right? And then on every August 12th, you can celebrate World Elephant Day, and however you wanna do it, dress up as an elephant, make elephant noises, make a craft, whatever you wanna do to help celebrate elephants. So those are some fun things you guys can do to help elephants. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? There, there was one. Yeah. Um, well, there's actually two. Okay, so perfect. big question yeah. about elephants. Okay. Can they jump? No, <laughs> they're not big on jumping because if, could you imagine? I mean, I'm not 10,000 pounds. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it some days and I can't jump. Really hard. <laughs> so the kind of the bigger you are, the harder it is to jump. So now they are not jumpers, they're not built for jumping. They're built for walking, that's for sure. <laughs> so are they really scared of small creatures like mice? <laughs> we love that, I love that myth. So. Um, it's interesting, so probably because I don't know if you know, elephants have kind of like small eyes, but the eyesight is okay, it's not the greatest. So probably having small things like a mouse because they're fast and they move really, you know, they move quickly and they scurry around, it's probably more of a startle factor where that myth came from. So it probably was that, you know, they see a mouse out of the corner and they're just out of the corner, like, whoa, what's that? But they're not gonna jump on a chair and go, oh my God, no, <laughs> like you see in cartoons. So no, so they're not really afraid of them. It's probably just they got startled by that quick movement, like we do. I don't know, but you guys, I've seen live mice come, you know, if you see a mouse run through your house, you're like, whoa, what is that? So it does give you that, that startle factor. So yeah, good questions. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, I'm talking, I can't talk. <laughs> good, all right. Well, if you have any more questions, I wanna thank you guys for joining us. We appreciate it. I wish I could have done this uh, in person. It's way more fun to do it in person, but I had fun today. I don't know about you guys, but you guys can learn more about myths too. You know, go to your library. You can't go to the library, but you can, I think you can get books. You can, I don't know if they do eBooks or not like that, but read about elephants, learn more about all those different animals and all those myths that are out there floating around and see if you can bust some more while you're out there. All right, guys, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, uh, Sand Hill Regional Libraries. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you next summer. All right, guys, take care and stay safe. It's the awkward wave time.